This morning we have a very interesting uh, problem, and to approach it we have to go back over a great deal of the world's thinking from uh, comparatively ancient times. The study of the human soul and of the world soul, uh, this study was developed most exhaustively by the Neoplatonists of Alexandria, particularly Plotinus and Proclus. These two great scholars, mystics and contemplators, deriving their inspirations from Plato and Pythagoras, evolved a concept of personal relationship between man and the universe that had not previously been emphasized. As a result of the fortunate location of the Alexandrian school of Neoplatonism, the uh, founders and developers of this philosophy were able to draw from practically all of the known religions of mankind. And the result was a tremendous advance in philosophical idealism. All of the Platonists and Neoplatonists were idealists. That is, they did not believe or accept uh, a materialistic attitude Uh, toward life and living. On the other hand, they were the first to make a clear reconciliation between scientific progress and mystical insight. They did not bring these two into conflict, but kept them in a completely complementary relationship. They found no reason to deny that which science advances but no reason to accept scientific opinion which is not within the scientific sphere. In other words, science has its own world. Its world is essentially the exploration of the material structure of things. This exploration has advanced knowledge and inspired idealism in many instances. But the uh, idealist does not accept the scientific position uh, that science has disproved uh, the mystical and metaphysical traditions of antiquity. It has not the equipment, nor the interest, uh, nor the background to pass judgment on sacred matters. On the other hand, it is a mistake for religion and mysticism uh, to attempt to dominate the sphere of material science, trying to discredit by theological means the scientific advancements of many very learned specialists. But side by side in Alexandria, these two systems lived together in harmony, and each advanced the contributions of the other. And today we realize that there is no greater potential power for the development of an idealistic philosophy of life than science, if science begins to seek for the realities behind the facts which it has accumulated. So on this basis, the Neoplatonists and other Greek and uh, later other Oriental systems began to study the mystery of what we call the human soul. It was obvious to the wise of all ages that man was not merely a body. It was also inconceivable to thoughtful persons that the creating process should produce a form of life such as humanity and lock that form into a mortal existence of three or four score years and then dissipate all that the individual has learned during that period of time. There would be no development for the individual under the materialistic concept of life. And it became essential to recognizing the actual integrity of a divine principle in order to develop slowly a system of thought which preserved the integrity of deity and at the same time advanced the materialistic forms of knowledge which were irreconcilable with theology unless reinterpreted. 
the human soul has been variously defined. Many different sects and creeds have their own approach to this simple but very interesting subject. The general theory is that the soul is a link between the body of man and the divine constitution in which he partakes. Therefore, the trinity of the ancients was spirit, soul, and body. With spirit as the source of all life, body as a reservoir or container of forms, and these linked together by an, by an energy or a principle which was called the soul. The soul, therefore, was created from the beginning to be a reconciler. Its purpose was to bring together uh, opposites which otherwise could not be uh, easily reconciled. In alchemy, Mercury was the symbol of the human soul, or the divine soul. It was the universal agent by means of which uh, salt and sulfur could be reconcil reconciled. S sulfur being the symbol of spirit, salt the, sp the symbol of body. Mercury was that which could absorb into itself other metals and substances and make an amalgam of them. Thus it became natural to the alchemy to think of the soul not only as a reconciler of spiritual and material forms, but a reconciler of attitudes, of beliefs, of opinions, of policies. The universal solvent, or the soul, was the reconciler of all things. And wherever conflict arises, the soul must reconcile the conflict. If we permit the conflict itself to endure without being reconciled, we then have individuals, nations, and worlds torn apart, not because there is a basic error involved, but because there is a secondary error, the error, error of assuming that things which are different uh, cannot be harmonized. Actually, the whole purpose of human evolution is to reconcile the differences of appearances and to demonstrate the sovereignty of one divine principle. Actually, we understand from Neoplatonism that as a spirit inhabits all things, bestowing upon them the life of existence, that this spirit, which is the universal fire, flame, or power, without which there can be no motion, no emotion, no conscious growth, no means of unfoldment, because actually all things are the growth within the substance of spirit and all growth is a to means toward the final purposes of the divine spirit. This being according to their ancient thinking, it was necessary for them to reconcile in their thinking and in their living all of the opposites of existence, realizing that opposites are dangerous because of their mutual conflicts but that all conflicts and all opposites are reconciled in God. And those who come nearer and nearer to participation in the divine principle find it ever easier to be friendly, to be cooperative, to be kind, to be gentle. Cooperation expresses itself through affection, through relationships. It is everywhere a bringing together for fruitfulness whether it in the physical world or in the psychic nature itself. Those things which are harmonized and brought together in friendliness become the basis of new generations of improved psychological and mystical conditions. Now today we have a world that is in a very confused state. And this confusion is, strangely enough, almost completely illusionary. This does not mean that the individual can simply erase it from his own experience. 
we rather take the attitude that there are things essentially true and things which appear to be true but are not essentially so. This is one of the problems we have in life. Everywhere there are things that seem irreconcilable, whether they be political, social, economic, religious, or philosophical. But all these can be reconciled because they are essentially vitalized by one power. They are expressions of one energy, this energy being diversified through the bodies of planets, through the structures of society, through the nations of the world, and through the unfoldment of individuals. Yet all life is one. Therefore, the true discovery of the essential of life must bring reconciliation. It is because we have not achieved this that we are in trouble. Now, the question that the Neoplatonists approached rather successfully, and the Buddhists also, was if there is an essential unity, why is it not obvious to us? Why have we not received the blessing of this realization from the beginning of our existence? For this answer, we have to take a slight uh, detour into science. We have to realize that science has demonstrated certain truths or facts which are useful to us. Science is giving us an ever fuller understanding of the structure of the human mind. The human mind is a very interesting and delicate instrument manifesting through a still more delicate instrument, the brain. Now the mind of its own nature and of its own kind uh, is essentially a unity-seeking power. But in the development and evolution of human beings, the mind has become the great separator. The mind has been gradually accepted by most persons and by most systems of culture as the infallible estimator of values. What the mind says must be true. What the mind thinks must be defended. And whatever direction the mind turns its attention, it presents an interesting conflict. The human mind is a partly developed function. It is something that is not by any means perfect. And looking out upon the environment, the mind comes to conclusions which are derived from imperfect and immature faculty powers within the mind itself. Therefore, the mind is not infallible. The things we think are not necessarily true. The opinions we develop may be false. And practically all of our relationships with each other are determined by mental attitudes. All, alike, all likeness and dissimilarity are mental experiences. We like and dislike people, not because we understand them, but because the mind has presented to us an image of them. The mind, because it is incomplete, imperfect, and in a state of evolutionary development, is accepted as a final criterion when it cannot be a criterion to this degree. So as the Hindu tells us in his sacred book, the Gita, the mind is the slayer of the real. The mind is in bondage to the faculties and perceptions which have developed within man. These faculties and perceptions are highly competitive. They represent the unbalanced growths of various powers and perceptive power faculties. The individual as a physical person is largely dominated by the tyranny of his own thinking. He is dominated by his own conclusions about things he does not understand. He is the subject and victim of hypotheses. He is constantly frustrated by logic 
which is as estimated as the probably the great doctrine of fallacies and logic itself is the greatest of its own fallacies the person consequently looking out upon life does not see life as it is he sees it in terms of his own feelings if life has hurt him life looks bad if life has gratified him it is better if those around him agree with him they are wise if they disagree with him they are stupid and he has carried this into everything even broken up groups of uh, solid substances in this kind of pattern For the physician the, with the medical training has his own set of faculties conditioned uh, by his own training and yet although he may be trained with many others of his own kind physicians are not in general agreement each one has a major premise which he has interpreted or misinterpreted in terms of his own insight the same is true of law the same is true of architecture a building that pleases one person displeases another the world of music although it is one common unit is divided into innumerable subdivide subdivisions most of which are in competition with each other so we live in a world which is a unit indivi indivisible and indissolvable and we live in it in a state of complete and continuous segmentation as long as we follow this rule we have to depend largely upon the mind and the mind itself in our particular case today is getting very weary the mind is gradually coming to realize that it does not have the answers and that no matter how cleverly we intellectualize we may still be wrong we also know that the mind because of the ingenuity within it is continually complicating the dilemma the mind trying to find ways out of this labyrinth simply creates new blind passageways for itself it is caught in a web of intellection uh, from which it is almost impossible for it to escape now mind in humanity is divided into many levels there are many who are more gifted than others who have greater and better intellectual faculties than others but this does not solve the situation the comparatively small mind has small troubles but does not escape trouble the great minds have great troubles which they compound for each other there seems to be no way out of this net of mental overemphasis or specialization considering the facts as they are then uh, we know that buddha developed the concept of the mental coordinator the mental coordinator had no infallibility uh, no divine sanction and was in many cases indefensible but it was simply what we now know it to be namely a common market in which various faculty testimonies uh, are examined and combined and ordered or disordered as the case may be the mind simply mingles together the testimonies of the five senses and gives us a verdict now this verdict may or may not be true according to the testimonies of the sensory perceptions the evaluation of a personal or collective experience is very difficult to one person a certain thing may be a disaster to another the beginning of a new and better life everything de is determined by the ability uh, to integrate the experience factors in human consciousness so the neoplatonists developed this simple notion that you might as well get over the idea 
that the word mind is a synonym of I or me. When you say I think, you do not really mean I think. You mean I have given the power of thought to the mind. The mind is thinking, not me. I am behind the mind somewhere, usually lost in the bushes. <laughs> when we say I think, therefore it is a mistake. And when we say I know, we are in even a greater danger of dilemma. <laughs> because in these cases, we have always an identification of self with mind and they are not the same thing. We also have a very uh, complicated relationship because the mind becomes the basis of a series of egoistic extensions of activity. I want does not mean that the spirit is in need. It merely means that the mind is avaricious. When we say, I hope, there is a great question as to the consistency of the hope, but we still refer to it always in the terms of I. So we assume that within ourselves is an absolutely correct function, process. There is an infallible center, and we call it I, but really it is the mind and there is really nothing infallible about the intellect. The intellect is an instrument which properly used can give us great help and consolation, but misused can bring us constantly into greater difficulties and dangers. So the Neoplatonist attempted to transfer the center of personal allegiance from the mind to the soul. The soul being the part of man which corresponds to the soul in the nature of the divine. The soul is always a savior, a sota. The soul is the beloved son of the spirit. The soul is the mediator between heaven and earth. It is the power to reconcile or bring together or reinterpret in terms of integrities the various conflicts due to intellect. The soul is therefore superior to intellect. Now in modern times we've made a very serious mistake. We have developed, developed an art or science which we call psychology. The word simply meaning the language of the soul. But the average psychologist does not even believe in a soul. He is completely linked to the physical sciences. He believes that the brain is the instrument through which a mental focus functions and that this mental center is the person. He does not understand that the so-called psyche of science is simply another name for Buddha's machine of the six sensory powers. The psychologist does not recognize in most instances that there is something above mind in the structure of the individual or of the world. The Neoplatonists working with the, public, uh, with the subject of soul came to the conclusion that the soul was a kind of entity in itself that it was something that had a nature of its own and that just as the body of the individual is derived from the elements of nature which in turn are derived from the material structure of the divine purpose so the soul is composed of the elements of a psychic realm that it is composed of, an, of actual materials soul substances and that this soul is a body in itself. But instead of being bound to the limitations of matter, because it is more subtle, more highly attenuated, 
and originates from a higher plane of creation. It has an extension of power, an extension of insight, and an extension of authority far greater than the mind. Therefore, the individual who is wise tries in every way possible to transfer the allegiances which he has given to the mind and bestow them upon the soul, allowing the soul to guide him into the proper use of his own mind or the use of the body. Unless he makes this adjustment, the soul power as such is not able to carry forward the great purposes of evolution. Now in science, evolution is a formal growth or a development of material forms and has been traced fairly successfully by the Darwinian theory. But actually, evolution is the gradual victory of soul power over body. Evolution is an ideation. It is an unfoldment from within by which more and more of the outer life is directed by inner soul power. Now if there is a soul in man, there's another in inevitable conclusion, that this soul originates in the divine soul. No man or human being or any creature can possess an attribute which is not in the nature of the creating power. Nothing can be bestowed by the Creator which the Creator itself or himself does not possess. As the soul function is more and more obvious and has been pretty carefully studied, it becomes obvious that the human soul is descended from and derived from the soul of deity, and that therefore it possesses a considerably greater range of realizations than are found in the mind or in the psychic, psychological organism of modern science. In this uh, thought, therefore, we find that all nature or the universe in all its parts consists of a creating process, a transformational process, and a gradual process of regeneration or redemption. Things are created, they are sustained, and they are gradually transformed. And in the terms of the psychic nature, the transformation is a growth, an extension of the individual. And all evolution is the release of soul from mind and body. And the more of the soul power is ma that is manifested, the nobler the person will be the more genuine their integrities will be, and they will begin to release more and more of those primary virtues which we attribute to deity, but the seeds of which are also in ourselves. Now here we are in a prime muddle at the present time as far as world conditions are concerned. It is obvious that science can't solve the mystery. The scientist can complicate life and in many senses and ways can facilitate the physical security of the individual. He can do many things to help him uh, to be more comfortable, um, more secure in his way of life. And it looked for a long time as though science was the saving power of the universe. But in the midst of all of its benevolent bestowals, it gave us the, uh, the bomb, the, the uh, hydrogen bomb. This, in one fell swoop, destroyed the basic confidence of humanity in science. Realizing that something was wrong, little people asked questions. And one of the most common and simple questions is, if the scientist is truly a superior person, why does he not have the insight and wisdom to protect people from his own inventions? If he is truly enlightened, how can he bestow a 
death-dealing device, the worst known since the beginning of time, upon a comparatively, comparatively uh, unequipped humanity. So in a very short time, something happened and people began to ask little questions. One of the questions was, couldn't the scientist, with all his brilliance and all his inventions and all his machinery, foresee what he was doing? Could he not realize that if he continued in the present course, that he would ultimately come upon these deadly devices? The scientist really had no good answer for this, any more than we can answer why it is that the automobile industry is in great difficulty because it continued for years to make large and difficult cars in, in the presence of a dwindling fuel supply. Could not these brilliant industrialists realize uh, the fact long before they began to blame other nations for importing small cars? Why didn't they make them themselves? Some strange blind spot. And this blind spot is really the dramatic symbol of exactly what the mind is. One great big blind spot. <laughs> Surrounded by a radiant fringe of desires and ambitions. This is what we had. So having lost faith, somewhat at least, and more every day, in the omnipotence of science, it became reasonable to realize that there was something lacking in the constitution of man, that in some mysterious way he had been led astray, that it was not the result of eating an apple that gave us this major pandemonium. The real cause of it was the constant compromise of principle for profit. Everywhere at all times, Man would do what the Gator tells in Faust, he would sell his soul for temporal gain. Now the soul that he sold, of course, really wasn't for sale. It was something locked within himself. He could not barter it, but he could create a structure of attitudes which would not permit it to develop. He could isolate it and imprison it. And this is very largely what he has done. He has not been able or willing to give it an opportunity to reveal itself. Now how do we make soul reveal itself? Well, the first thing we have to do is believe in it. And if we doubt that there is such a thing, then we can look back through the great codes of the world, the great codes of morality and ethics, and discover that they are not based upon science. They are not really based upon philosophy, although they may have many philosophical elements. These codes are all based upon a deep human sense of value. These codes are based upon a spiritual approach to existence. They take spiritual power, transmute it into a kind of higher mysticism, and by this they are able to judge the values of material things. So we have evidence of soul everywhere. We have it in the mother's love for a child. We have it in the love of man and woman. We have, a man, we have it in the love of nation or country or race, love of art, love of music, appreciation for beauty. Protinus in his great essay on the beautiful tells us that we call a thing beautiful because it is appealing and pleasing to a beauty in ourselves. If the beauty was not in us, we would never see it anywhere else. In the same way with architecture. Many buildings are built by persons who obviously have no concept of beauty and are perfectly willing to compromise beauty for economy, cost less, or for efficiency, which may or may not cost less. But the point is that the true architect fulfills a beauty within himself. The true author writes a beauty from within his own heart and mind. 
But if the mind runs the heart and the mind runs the soul, he is going to write for profit because he is not going to be aware and he is going to place immediate advantage to himself above the common good of humanity. We have this completely through the television industry, through practically all of the entertainment field, and in most forms of business. Business is all pointed to profit by appealing to that part of man which is not soul, and allowing the soul factor to die of starvation. It won't die, but it's slow in coming around. And it will only be when man is weary of his mistakes that he is really going to get, a, get, a, get hold of his own resources. There is so much more in the human being than has ever come out of him that there is great cause for ultimate optimism that the thing will work out in the end. Now, in looking around us in life, we become aware that the confusion of the individual is based upon a collective confusion, or that one way or another the two are related. Some would probably say with considerable integrity that the world confusion is primarily the result of the confusion in the human being. But where, whichever way we care to view it, the fact remains that we are in one of the most troubled periods in the history of our civilization. A troubled period in which we are desperately seeking some kind of a solution. We have reached a point in mental isolation in which it is almost impossible to convert an individual to anything he does not want to believe. He cannot be converted, he cannot be legislated. If government tries to impose virtue upon the individual, there will be a revolution. If the individual attempts to impose virtue upon government, he becomes himself in grave danger. The, the whole situation is locked on a level, and the level is simply too low to provide survival. It has to be changed. How are we going to accomplish this change? Nature probably will have to do it. What we try to do ourselves is now too mixed up with our own mistakes. And we bring young people into the world, we misinform them, miseducate them, dedicate them to goals which are not real, and then as a kind of penance fee at the end we give them a pension. <laughs> But the entire structure is wrong. The purpose of education from a duco is to draw forth from the person that which is within himself, that is his soul power. Instead of that, we cram into his brain and mind all forms of conflicting and indigestible elements and expect him to become an enlightened citizen. It's just not possible. He turns to religion for help, and he comes upon a battle of creeds. And he finds that too much religion now is very overconscious of financial uh, improvement. <laughs> also, we turn to industry to find it completely perverted so that the only consideration is profit. So the young person today is taught uh, how to make a living, but never how to build a life. He is taught what he has to do, the compromises he has to make in order to be successful in a civilization in which true success, in its better sense of the word, is practically impossible. To meet this, we cannot expect a government or any of this type of thing to take the lead. The improvement of each individual is his own private job. And he must finally come to this realization. Any person who so desires can gradually, through a process of quiet information and meditation, 
contemplation of values and reference to the enlightened scriptural and sacred writings of the world, he can come to a reasonable conclusion concerning what constitutes integrity. He can begin to realize that this little voice of conscience that's within himself may very well be the voice of his own soul and that this voice continually blames him when he's wrong and impels him to be right. By gradually developing the internal resources of ourselves, we can gain values that will enable us to achieve a victory over circumstances. This victory is a private victory. And for the most part, uh, we can achieve it with practically no opposition from other people. Some sacrifice, yes, because if we are trying to be right, we cannot share in the spoilage of that which is wrong. But for the most part, we can quietly adapt our own hearts and minds to the realities of life. Instead of sitting back in a state of abject terror at the changes and vicissitudes and dangers of the day, we can begin to have the achievement of following the example in the gospel of where Jesus walks upon the waters and told the storms to be silent and still than they were. The individual can learn to live in this world constructively and creatively and morally if he so desires. And it is only through the gradual development of these qualities and characteristics that he can ultimately become a self-protecting, self-leading being. It is the only way he is going to overcome the ills of his own mind and gradually make the mind an instrument of value for the development of soul power. The mind turned downward develops physical conspiracies. The mind turned upward to the soul becomes the priest in the temple of enlightenment. It has to be worked out through our own dedications to the values that are necessary to protect life. Now on the general collective field of things out in the large world, we have nothing but an infinite number of repetitions of exactly the same structure that we have within man himself. The world's soul is the, uh, the unity. It is the planet, the solar system later, and the galaxy are maintained in their proper relationships to each other and unfold their own internal poten potentials according to the will of deity. So the world soul today is a unit which is broken up into minor manifesting parts in the souls of human beings, animals, and other creatures. It is even present in the vegetable through our own dedications to the values that are necessary to protect life. Now on the general collective field of things out in the large world, we have nothing but an infinite number of repetitions of exactly the same structure that we have within man himself. The world soul is the, as the unity. It is the mass of psychic integrity by means of which the whole planet, the solar system later, and the galaxy are maintained in their proper relationships to each other and unfold their own internal poten potentials according to the will of deity. So the world soul today is a unit which is broken up into minor manifesting parts in the souls of human beings, animals, and other creatures. It is even present in the vegetables and the minerals. The soul is a principle of regenerating life, guiding the evolution of all things to the unfoldment of their own spiritual integrity. 
If, for instance, we pollute our drinking water, we're going to be sick. If we fill our air with smoke and chemicals, we're going to be ultimately asphyxiated. If we waste our resources as petroleum, natural gas, and so on, we're going to someday wake up and find this bottle we call the earth is going to be empty. And we can't wait around for the hundreds of millions of years that it took to achieve the alchemy of petroleum. So we have to realize that it is necessary to use wisely what we have. And uh, Ben Franklin was quite correct, correct when he said that willful waste ends in woeful want. There is no other possibility. So we have also a soul reservoir. We have an energy field of materials by which the psychic integration is maintained. It is from this field that each individual soul receives the nourishment and the sustenance necessary for its continuance. Just as the body is derived from physical materials, so the mind from mental and the soul from uh, psychic materials. These materials might be likened to a great ocean or to a tremendous reservoir of energy. The final source of the soul reservoir being the nature of deity itself. The soul is a, is a similar thing in a sense to light. For as the physical sun lights the body and continues to illuminate the planet and all of its various forms of life, so the psychic sun illuminates the inner light, nourishes it, and makes possible that the inner life shall be fruitful and shall fulfill its destiny. Now if by any chance we pollute the material elements of life, we are in trouble. If we abuse or pervert the soul problems, we are also in trouble. The soul, the power of which is used perversely, is sickened, and the entire field of psychic energy is polluted by the misuse of soul potentials. Uh, if the soul wishes peace, and man continues to war, he is corrupting the psychic sources of his own idealistic growth. This corruption affects not only the present life in which he is embodied, but affects the internal composition of his nature, which he must carry with him beyond the grave. It naturally then follows that the pollution of the soul principle by millions and hundreds of millions and billions of people all over this planet Earth results in a toxic condition in the psychic energy which protects the planet. We cannot misuse any form of energy without interfering with the natural life of all things. The temper fit of the human being may seem to be peculiarly his own, but whether he realizes it or not, or ever able to prove it or not, the decay of his own disposition will ultimately affect all the flora and fauna around him in nature. It may even affect the survival of his planet. It is much more dangerous for the psychic nature to be corroded than it is even for, the, for a, neutron, a neutron bomb to be formed. It is more dangerous for the individual as a mass of people to pervert the essentials of life as far as their moral values are concerned. It is far more dangerous uh, to do this than it is uh, to expose the physical world to chemical warfare. The cycle's chemical warfare is already hard at work. Now we know that vibration is a reality also, whether we like to admit it or not. And we know that there are many different levels and standards of vibration. 
We know there are harmonious vibrations and inharmonious vibrations. We know that there are conditions arising around us all the time in which our own vibratory attitudes uh, become important. Psychometry has shown us that the individual leaves a vibratory pattern on a room whenever he passes through it, that this vibration also uh, can affect things around him. It is noted that certain persons coming into a room will kill flowers almost instantly. Others, the flowers will live longer. But vibration is very important. And all vibrations can be divided into two essential types, constructive and destructive. A constructive vibration is one in which soul power dominates. Therefore, it is concerned with beauty, with hope, with love, with faith, uh, with friendship, with unselfishness, compassion, service, all these types of things. The lack of self-centeredness is one of the important factors in good vibratory relationships. The individual who is over-personal is always competitive and his vibrations begin to go down to a lower level. On the other side, the negative vibrations of fear, anxiety, jealousy, conflict, the perpetuation of grudges and evils, intense competition, and all of the false emotional relationships between living things, largely due to ignorance or mental condemnation, all these types of vibrations are killers. They destroy that which is good. They make it increasingly difficult for nature to preserve and maintain the purity of the psychic field in which we live. Today, as we read the newspaper or watch television programs, we realize that we are in a world in which there is much conflict, much negative thinking, much self-centeredness, and in even a corrupting factor. I think it would be better for all humanity if all international news was given by radio rather than television, on the grounds that the visualization added to the words creates an overemphasis and permits a great deal of misrepresentation. We do not need to be constantly flooded with bad news. Now people will say, well, if it's true, we have to hear about it. This is not entirely a valid statement, however. If we have to hear things, if we should be told that which happens, if we must hear in order to be informed, then we must have a balanced program of things to hear. We must be just as quick to emphasize a good circumstances, a circumstance as a bad one. When someone does something really worthwhile, this should also be given full coverage. If a new p pattern of thought or living which is going to be helpful is being developed, we should be kept constantly informed of that. But for the most part, all the good we try to do, or others try to do, is ignored, and only scandal, gossip, and hatred are circulated. This is not fair to the individual because it helps to corrupt the mental attitude and block the development of the inner psychic value. We are gradually created into a strange toxic condition. And most information as we have it today is not reliable and extremely toxic. To meet this type of a circumstance, each person has to be his own censor. We each have to do those things which we believe to be essentially right. There is no leadership that can come to us from this world that is going to be perfect. But the leadership of the divine within ourselves is the leadership we'll have to live with long after our present civilization has faded away. We have to be led by that which is right. And those of us who are mortal creatures in this world were born to obey 
that which was fashioned to lead and control. We have to obey the divine purpose. If we do not, we penalize ourselves and then shake off this of God. To uh, fulfill our divine purpose, therefore, we must dedicate our resources individually and collectively uh, to those labors which are according to the divine law. No other way can we escape or evade or avoid the emergencies under which we live today. It is going to be very easy for people to explain why our leaders should be more honest, why we should have a better type of government. But it's always necessary then to pause and ask, how honest are we? And how good are the leaderships from within ourselves? Are we actually advising a condition for others which we really have no intentions of applying to our own natures? that we want to have a world that is secure so that in that secure world we can do what we please. We can break all the rules without endangering the security of society. Such cannot occur. So when the uh, problem of integration of values comes into focus, it is necessary to realize that it is our duty to cleanse the psychic field of our own lives as Hercules cleansed the stables in the ancient legend. We have to gradually bring our own personal conduct into harmony with integrities. Now it may be that in the course of time we will realize that the universal government which governs everything from the planet to the galaxy and beyond, can be transformed into a form of management for humanity. In other words, the great archetype of universal procedure can be brought down to the level of our human problems and applied thereto successfully. There is only one plan but it can be adapted to innumerable levels of necessity. Someday we may build what the Buddha philosophy calls the universal community, the universal commonwealth. This is a commonwealth in which the democracy of man is preserved by the unity of deity that all commonwealths are the result of a cooperation that these planets and the worlds and the suns and all of the various forms of life are a great community and that this community in order to survive must dedicate all of its individual activities to the protection of the common good. There can be no competition in a divine world because in the divine world there is nothing lacking and nothing can be in greater or lesser abundance. Each living thing receives its own allotment and in the presence of that allotment must make the next step in the growth of its own values. If we allow our minds to contemplate the possibility that we are toxifying our psychic atmosphere, we might get a lot of big explanations for problems that are very confusing to us today. We can realize how things like alcohol and narcotics addictions and things of this nature can exist. They can definitely exist if we block the integrity values within ourselves. They can also be precipitated by the corruption of the psychic field. If you poison the energy which must support life, you will then have a de crippled and deformed life. If we take the sources of the powers and energies which we have from the sunlight up and down and we corrupt or variously disease these forces, then everyone, everything that builds a body must build it from material that is less adequate 
We have to build bodies from materials which have not in them uh, the, the true energies of life. We, buy, we build them from debilitated materials, carrying within this debilitation a variety of negative imp impulses toward corruption. If the body itself is not capable of being normal, then the function of the life through the body, no matter how noble the effort may be, is going to be in some way or other uh, disadvantaged. Now if we take, for example, the problem of our psychological or mental energies, or our vital energies, the human body physically is in a sea of vital energy. This vital energy moving through the endocrine system and through the various nervous parts of the human structure, this vital energy is part of a great sea of energy. And this sea of energy is something in which we all exist. Now if this energy is perverted and polluted, this energy becomes less healthy. And where a few pollute it, it may not mean too much. But when the whole human race starts to pollute it, then the energy field of humanity is diseased. There can be no question whatever that uh, millions of persons are coming into this life disadvantaged by the inability to find proper materials from which to build bodies or to derive as part of their common heritage materials from their parents which are suitable to build a good body. If the parent had, has corrupted theirs and by mental attitudes and emotional intensities have reduced the quality of the material to be used in the building of the body of a child, this child is going to be uh, underprivileged in terms of energy for the rest of their lives. Now we have all kinds of synthetics to try to build up these energies. We are off on health foods and dietetic programs and everything you can think of because we do not feel good. And the reason that we do not feel good finally is that we are not good. We are breaking rules every minute and trying to patch them at $25 a consultation. We are not doing what is necessary. Now, it's quite possible that a person in middle life is going to wake up and realize that they've been the victim of this vast conspiracy, that they didn't get a good body when they came in, and they didn't do very much with the body they did get, and they have continued in one way or another to contaminate it ever since. These people may wake up, and while they cannot undo all the damage, they can correct as much as possible become a little wiser and plan for a better future. But if they just drift along on the same old way, they in turn are going to be the ancestors of further disabled generations. If this energy field is sufficiently uh, corrupted, it's going to affect the vital body of the earth. Now, the, the vital energy of the, earth, of the earth is most obvious in the plant kingdom where the uh, energy moving from within the earth to the surface and outward sustains a mass of living things that grow largely in the direction of that energy flow. The vital body of the human being is responsible for the hair, which is really a crystallization along rays of vital energy. If the vital energy inside fails, the hair falls out. If the vital energy on the planet in the planet fails, the plant life is disturbed. If the plant life is disturbed, we're going to have poorer harvests. We're going to have less nutrition in the food that we eat. And the vital body of the earth, more or less diseased by the vital body of the things living on it, is going to gradually become corrupted and infirm. And the necessity for cleansing this situation is very important. But to simply pour a little new fertilizer on the acreage is not the answer. The answer is 
that this vital resource must be protected by the individuals who are themselves living off that same vitality in their invisible causal natures. The person who is constantly wasting energy is not only wasting his own, he is wasting that necessary for the tomato down the street. We are depleting the whole field. Now when we start depleting things, sickness sets in. When we start depleting or mistreating the human body, sickness sets in. And a very large part of sickness in the human body is a result of the blockage of the natural flows of energy. The individual whose energy fields are disturbed is sick. When the energy field of the earth is disturbed, it's sick. And when the individual gets sick, he gets irritable. He gets difficult. He may also get actually very temperamental. Or he may ultimately fall in a fit. Or have paralysis or a coronary. Now the earth has its equivalence of these things. If we keep on disturbing the energy fields of the earth long enough, we're going to have a new wave, a rash of great storms, hurricanes, earthquakes, fires, floods, and every type of incident that results from the corruption of the basic energies which sustain life. We cannot waste these energies. We cannot continue to pour smog into the air without ultimately bringing danger to every living thing. When we have a criminal that we don't know what to do with and we can't really arrest him, we simply put him next into another state next door and let another state take care of him. This goes on until he either passes on or commits something for which we can punish him. If we don't like somebody, we try to have them move away. But these problems that we face today will not move away because there's no place else to go. The earth's problems have to be solved here. And to solve these problems, we have to make the right use of every resource. With right use, right control, right attitudes, our resources can be extended over a great period of time. And we will also discover that we develop within ourselves new sources of energy. The great uncatalogued uh, or unclassified source of energy for man is man. The human being is the only great source of energy that can replenish itself. Only living things can replenish. All the things that are locked in the earth and so forth, when they're gone, they do replenish also, but so slowly it does us very little good. But the replenishment of our own energies goes on, becoming more and more important as we improve. If we can assume for a moment that the human being fulfilled the pattern for which he was intended, it is quite safe to say that through conservation, care, integrity, lack of selfishness, that the natural physical energies upon which we depend for existence today, and which are causing us no end of worry and anxiety, that those sources will last until the natural improvement of man reveals and makes available to him energy sources which he knows nothing about at the present time. He can outgrow his need for this material energy and depend more and more upon the psychic fields around him. He can be nourished until he outgrows the need of it. And when the time comes and he is born, actually out of a material state, he will find that there have been changes in his own nature, as in the nature of a newborn child, that will enable him to adjust to forms of nutrition that he doesn't know anything about today. But if he continues to stay as he is, blunt and self-centered, opinionated, and ambitious, in all probability he's going to run out of everything.
But this doesn't mean that everyone has to have this experience. The individual's relationship with his own energy sources are, complete, are completely personal. If the individual performs the alchemical transmutation within himself, he, is, he cannot be destroyed along with the guilty because the whole distribution of the situation makes this impossible. He will undoubtedly find that all of his own kind who have made similar achievements will have the solution to their problems. But if no change is made in disposition, if man earns nothing better, he will get nothing better. But the workman is worthy of his hire. So if we try, we make it work. But if we don't try, we'll be in trouble. The trouble is spreading. We see it every day. We see groups of people who should be building better lives uh, under influences which apparently cannot be withstood. The psychic field is sick. The psychic field is sick and nervousness excitement, hysteria, violence, these things come when the relationships of the parts of man's metaphysical organization are in turmoil. As there is no organization within the compound of the individual, then the individual will manifest as completely disorganized. To meet this, uh, the thoughtful person must begin to make whatever remedies and achievements he can to improve the situation. He must overcome all of the pettiness which has made him stay small. He is going to have to get over all of the ulterior motives which drive him, force him, press him, impel him, and begin to, to realize the very definite facts. And the most important facts for him to realize, perhaps the most important, is that he is only a visitor here. It is, he is almost a hostage. He is uh, surrounded by a violent situation, and it's taking a long time to get him out of it. But he is only here because he has a lesson to learn. The graduates don't stay here. And those who have finished the experiences of this world are not forced to come back and go over it again. The only way they come back is when, out of charity and compassion, they come back to try to help others. But the individual who finishes his experience here is released from this entire cycle of materialistic pressures. And having achieved the fulfillment, having received his diploma, as far as this world is concerned, he goes on to other things. There is no uh, permanence here. The worse we are, the longer we stay. This is another discomforting thought. <laughs> I know many people who have said to me, if I ever get out of here, I'm never coming back. I have, from my own opinion at least, news for them. They'll be back very quickly. Because no one ever gets away from a problem unless he solves it. And nature is not going to give a diploma to an individual who can't read or write. So we have the inevitable fact that the more selfish we are, the more arrogant we are, uh, the more materialistically oriented we are, the longer we'll be here. We're going to be here until we learn for good and all that this is a place to learn, but not a place to settle back to rest in the lap of luxury. We are not here primarily to have fun, and the only way we can have fun in this world is to enjoy growing. That comes the nearest to it, and it has considerable advantage. 
So we are now wondering about earthquakes. We're wondering about all these catastrophes. We know that we are only a few hours from a plague unless we use every possible means of sanitation. All these things hang over us and we're discouraged. It looks as though we've been building desperately for something that wasn't going to happen. I think we'll ultimately have to realize that the present dilemma is probably the most encouraging symptom that we have. The fact that we're in trouble up to our ears is really encouraging because it proves beyond all doubt that there is universal justice. <laughs> it proves that if you do a thing, you pay for it. Therefore, we are dealing primarily with an honest, universal purpose. And this is the most encouraging thing. And we are reasonably certain that deity cannot be bribed, corrupted, or picketed. We realize that the power that runs all things can is, cannot be contaminated by self-ambition, by ambition of any other kind, by any type of intimidation, or by morbid sentimentalism. The thing is as it must be. Now, if we live in a universe that's honest, there's hope for all of us. The only thing we have to do is be honest, too. This is not easy because we have trained ourselves for thousands of years in the delicate art of dishonesty. <laughs> and dishonesty seems very pleasant because it meets the personal selfishness of the moment, but leaves us in a lot of trouble. So the fact that things are difficult more or less proves that you cannot do it wrong and be happy. This implies that if you do it right, you could be happy. And this is where the positive side of the thinking comes in. Our real job at the moment is to realize why we are here and not to wring our hands. We are here to think about what we can observe and reflect upon. We are able at this moment to study a vast textbook made up of the records of all human beings and other creatures on the earth at the present time their problems and their relationships, and how these have descended to them from past ages. All this information is now available. While we were doing all right, we wouldn't even open the book. But now it is possible for us to realize that this information is worthwhile, <coughs> that we can use it, and that if we do really settle down to the problem, and we take the universal archetype as correct, we can say to ourselves, I can do as I please. I can break the law and suffer, or I can keep the law and achieve security. And it's just that inevitable. And as days go by and everything here gets a little worse and a little worse and a little worse, the inevitables are going to begin to show more clearly. We are going to realize that some people are born virtuous, some achieve virtue, but the majority have to have it thrust upon them. And we are in the glorious state of having it thrust upon us at the present moment. And nothing could be better for us. And nothing makes us more miserable. <laughs> we don't want it. We want to be spoiled. We want to live by a spoiled system. We ought to have anything we can see that is expensive. We expect to be supported, we expect to be inspired, and we expect to be forgiven any mistakes that we do make. If this world was really a little ball floating in space without management, some of these things might have a vestige of truth in them. But as part of a great plan of life going somewhere, and, in, and part of a larger pattern which must always rule and descended from the divine mind which must always know. This particular situation is really part of a well-organized, perfectly honest, and therefore utterly desirable educational system. We are going to have to learn to keep the rules. 
and we have made little rules of our own which we have made much easier because we made these rules to match our fancy. We have made rules that by keeping them and that enables us to make all our mistakes. But we must revise these rules and bring them back again to the divine order of things and realize that the rules that men make can be broken. But the rules of the universe, if they are broken, break men. There is no way out of this. And yet it is not dismal. It's not fatalistic. It's not horrible. It's not something to cause us all to fall into melancholia. It is a remarkable and wonderful process through the acceptance and understanding of which we can come to a sense of security and value otherwise impossible. We can say to ourselves, it is a blessing to be alive now in spite of the problems because now is the time in which we can learn probably the most important lessons that face humanity at the present time. So with quietude of inner life, with patience, with intelligence, with compassion, with quietude, we can contemplate the values. And instead of becoming constantly irritated, upset, and disturbed, we can begin to transform the, what we know into our own code of conduct. We can give more and more attention to things that we should learn and should not be afraid of learning. We should not be afraid of experiences because it is our own inner life that can take the pain and the fear out of them and help us to realize that some of the things we have previously considered as tragic were really the most important that ever happened to us. If we begin to think constructively, we will not only achieve a better tone of life, but the psychic field which must support our integrities uh, will be reinforced and its energies will be purified and we will be sending back into that field a group of vibratory constructive rates that will nourish the field because we have nourished the parts of it in ourselves. Every good thought sent out into space stands as a testimony to growth. Every poor thought falls as a testimony to error and to regression. So it's very important that we try to learn lessons rather than hate things, rather than suffering constantly from bickering and competition, that we use our energies wisely and purify in every way that we can our motives. For our motives are more important than our deeds. And if our motives are wrong, even the best deed loses most of its value. And if a motive is right, even a disappointment has value that will endure. Try to clean up the relationship between your own inner soul life and your mind and body. And if you can do some of this work yourself, you'll find climate will improve, uh, the, uh, there'll be less natural disasters, the harvest will be more abundant, and the policies of nations will relax. In a home where the parents argue all the time, the children are nervous wrecks. In a world that argues all the time, each of the human beings in it is a nervous wreck. And those who have suffered from this type of situation should be relieved of the pain. Let us try then to let the soul show through let the tremendous wisdom, compassion of the eternal influence us sufficiently so that we shall live wisely, live pleasantly, live kindly, and place the unfoldment of the God in us above the accumulation of worldly possessions. If we can get these thoughts a little straighter in our mind, we will save ourselves a lot of energy in this life and build into our consciousness something important to take with us when we leave here and, when, and to bring back with us when we come. All these points 
are of course briefly outlined but perhaps they will help in some way to clarify some of this problem thank you very much